introduce you to our other speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Winslow Hansen. Dr. Hansen, I have to remind myself, is a fire ecologist, and he'll tell you all about fires, but he is at heart and in training a landscape ecologist with a PhD from the University of, of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and he has been really looking at the issue of fires and, and, and regeneration of forests and how fires affect forests for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So it is a great pleasure to have him as a colleague at the Cary Institute. For those of you who don't know us well, we are a small, about 100 people, independent research institute based in Millbrook, New York, which is about 100 miles north of New York City. Uh, we are interested in three real areas of research. We're interested in research that informs us about trying to understand the dynamics of the future, right? And I think this talk is a piece of that. We are interested in the issues surrounding the ecology of human well-being, and that will include many different things, but we are unabashed in uh, our acknowledgement that a lot of what we do, we do to get better understanding of environmental processes to help develop better solutions uh, for human well-being and equity and justice. And then the third piece is really understanding the role of biodiversity in ecosystem function. And not, my, my background's in wildlife and I like critters, but it's not just the individual species, but how species interact to form communities and how those communities function. Uh, we work all over the world, but we like to say we have deep local roots and global reach. Anyway, so welcome tonight. Uh, and tonight we will be talking about the Western Fire and Forest Resilience Cooper Collaborative. Uh, we also call it a center, so I have to make sure that I uh, try and keep consistent so people know what I'm talking about. Um, and this is a collaborative that Winslow has built, uh, which has seed funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation out in California, and we are incredibly grateful to them, and which is literally just launching. Uh, this is our first public event, and Winslow will tell you more about the plans for that as we go on tonight. Um, Dr. Hansen, uh, let's start with the obvious. Right? So I think that for New Yorkers, fire was an abstract event. Uh, you know, if you lived out west or you traveled to uh, Singapore or other places where fire and smoke have been a problem for a number of years, you would you know, know about it. But most New Yorkers thought it was an abstract idea until June when you, all of the boreal forests in Canada started burning and all the smoke started coming down here. And so, you know, uh, I, I guess the easiest way to ask is, what's going on? Is this the new normal and, and why is this happening? Yeah, it's, um, so thanks so much for organizing this and doing this with me. Um, it's been an extraordinary year for fire in the boreal forests of Canada and, and I think it's one of the first times that in the Northeast it's really hit home in a way that's, that's personal. So smoke is one of those things that really captures people's attention for obvious reasons. Um, this year, 43, as of yesterday, which I, I checked, 43 million acres has burned in Canada this summer. That's 12 times what burned last year and six times the 10-year average. And it's released a tremendous amount of carbon to the atmosphere, 350 megatons is the estimate, which people are thinking will be about three times the annual emissions from all the other sectors in Canada. So we're talking about a ton of stuff going up in the atmosphere, and, and a lot of that ends up being smoke, right? And that smoke is distributed far from fires. It's one of the things that, that most impacts people that aren't directly affected by fire. Um, smoke got as far as Dallas a few weeks ago from the Canadian fires, and of course in June we all experienced it here in New York. Um, pretty seriously. The CDC is amazing in their speed at doing studies. They've already done some research on this and they found during the, the 19 days of high wildfire smoke that asthma related ER visits increased by 17 percent compared to average nationally and it was even larger here in New York State. So on June 7th that, that big day in all of our minds about smoke um, ER visits for asthma increased by 82% compared to average. So just, you know, unbelievable numbers. And as you pointed out in your question, um, these fires are historically extraordinary, but all the indications we have is that they're going to just continue to increase. And, and this is almost certainly to be the, the new normal that we're going to need to live with. And, and this isn't these aren't the only fires that have been happening in North America this year. Yeah, great point. So 
often what happens is we think about the place that's on fire right at that moment, and we forget that fire is a fundamental earth system process that happens in many ecosystems around the world, and the fire crisis is not limited to Canada. Well, many places in North America experience this regularly. So, you know, ask our colleagues and friends and family on the West Coast, and they'll be telling you, yeah, I've, I've been experiencing this for the last three decades, right? Yeah, yeah in Southern Europe. Absolutely. has fires every summer, and right. you know, so it's, it's elsewhere as well. Um, so what, we're getting more fire, we're getting hotter fires, we're getting longer fires. So what are the elements that you put together that creates a fire, and why are those changing so that we're getting more and more fires? Yeah, when you boil it down, it's really kind of a simple process, right? Un unlike much of ecology, my more brilliant colleagues work with these really complex, challenging systems. But, but fire, when you boil it down, requires three elements, right? So you have to have the weather conditions. It has to be sufficiently dry. Winds can be really important. You have to have enough fuels to have a fire, right? So the amount of fuel matters. And then topography can actually play a, a really important role. So um, you can think about a, a landscape, a forest that's just homogenous and flat. Fire is going to spread through that far more easily than a really mountainous landscape with lots of big cliffs and crags and snowy fields because it's so broken up. So topography is really important. And what's really interesting is the ways that we have to manage fire all directly tie to that triangle, right? So at the macro level, mitigating climate change is, is by far one of the most important things we can do because that would help us reduce warming temperatures that cause drying, that lead to these really dry fuels that are so flammable. But even at more local scales, we can do things like um, prescribed burning where we're actually igniting fires under relatively low risk conditions to consume those fuels in our landscapes in many places. We can, if the risk is too high to actually ignite fires, go out and mechanically thin forests to reduce fuel loads. And then we can even, in certain conditions, use wildfire itself. It's called managed wildfire use, where we allow these fires to burn in low risk places to consume those fuels. And if you're looking up at the slides, um, you can see this amazing drone shot that we're, we're looking at here, and it, I think it really illustrates it. So this is a, a stand of ponderosa pine in eastern Washington that we visited this summer that is a, a management experiment where they went in and they thinned first the small diameter materials, and then every few years they've been doing these low severity prescribed burns that clears out the understory, that provides uh, healthy conditions for the bigger trees to thrive and to be more resilient to future drought. So right here, this shot, I think, just highlights it. And it, it was really quite inspiring to see at that local scale. Yeah, so thinning and harvesting sounds like logging. So how does this differ from the sort of normal management of a, of, of a forest for timber? It's such an important distinction, right? So this is not logging that we're talking about. If you think about having a campfire, um, and you want to, you know, get it to flare up because it's a little cold, are you going to throw on your big diameter material? You're going to throw on a bunch of, like, you know, needles and dried small twigs. You're going to throw on the small stuff. We call it flashy fuels. And those are the fuels that really are flammable in these ecosystems and can lead to the unusually high severity fire that, that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, so when we're talking about mechanically thinning, it's, it's often targeting that smaller diameter material, removing those surface fuels that are important, rather than taking out the big, beautiful, big diameter trees that, that traditionally are logged. Yeah. So um, you are from one of my favorite towns in North America, Bozeman, Montana. You grew up in the West. You have been studying Western forest fires, particularly in the Rockies. And I was wondering, you know, you have a you know, three decade plus run of personal experience with that area. And how have those fires changed? How has the environment changed? And to what extent is climate change, um, and we're not just talking about climate because it's climate week, but because climate is the driver of so much of it, but how much has this uh, influenced those changes? Absolutely, it's, it's changed profoundly in my lifetime, and I'm, and I'm not particularly old, although I'm getting, getting there. Um, so, 
you know, Bozeman was an incredible place to grow up. It's right in the Rocky Mountains. There's big forests to go explore. And, and f for whatever reason, I was lucky enough to live right on the edge of the national forest land as a kid. Go walk out the back door and go play in the woods, right? And um, when I was eight, a massive wildfire came burning towards our subdivision. We were evacuated. Um, firefighters protected the house, and nobody's homes were burned, luckily, but it literally burned up to the, the backyard. It was actually interesting. My, just last week, my mother sent me a picture. I'd asked <laughs> for some pictures of being a kid in the woods, and right. they took a picture of the fire uh -huh. burning above the house. I was going to say with the house in the foreground. Yeah, it, right. was, it was unbelievable. It yeah. was larger than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is, you know, the next year, it looked charred, of course, and burned, but there were morel mushrooms starting to pop up, vegetation, and I remember going back out and playing in those woods and watching them recover over subsequent years. The, the thing, though, is that the fires of my childhood are not the fires that we have today. Driven by climate change, we're just seeing massive increases in burned area. So since 1984, two years before I was born, Annual forest burned area has increased by 1,320%. This is work that was done by a close colleague and friend of mine, Park Williams, who, who's joining us remotely tonight. Just a, a massive increase. We're looking on the slide right now at, at that time series of, of annual burned area in the West. Um, and there's a number of reasons why that's happening. Climate change is one that we're going to be talking about again and again. Another really interesting dynamic to keep in mind is that at the same time of these big increases in burned area, we're also seeing a lot of people move to the West yeah. for the same reasons that I have such a fond memory of it as a child, right? It's a gorgeous place to live. Um, so another colleague of mine has done some work quantifying the distribution of the what we call the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. And it's just a, a fancy name for homes that are either abutting or intermixed with wildland vegetation. These are some of the places that have the highest risk of, of burning in, in, in ecosystems and developments. And they found that like in 1990, about 10 million homes were in the wildland urban interface in the West. And by 2020, that's increased to 16 million. So that, that means a lot. That's a big deal for two reasons. The first is that you have a lot more at risk when you put fires in these fire or homes in these fire prone areas. The other thing is that people start a lot of fires, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So another colleague did this really interesting analysis where and they haven't been able to continue it because the data is no longer available. But in the nineteen nineties and early two thousands, across the United States as a whole, something like eighty percent of the fire starts were ignited by people. Now often those fires are smaller than wildfires, right? Because they're in places that are easier to suppress, they're close to roads, they're close to people. So they don't necessarily account for a massive amount of the burned area, but they are often really destructive fires. So one of the places that I think about a lot when I'm trying to wrap my head around this stuff is the front range of Colorado, right? right? So often the fires that are burning there are not the largest fires we have on record, but they're often some of the most destructive we have on record because of where they're occurring. And they're, you know, so the majority of fires are lit by people. The minority of land is burned by fires lit by people, but they happen to start them in their backyards, and in their backyards they have neighbors, and so you have a lot more damage to property and, and to person. That's absolutely right. Yep. Right. So, so um, that all makes really good sense, um, and. The question, next question I want to ask in the next slide we have, so we do try and make this look like we're, we're actually haven't rehearsed it, but we have, and we've got great <laughs> slides, and I, I thank my staff for that. But, you know, the next question I really want to, to pose has to do with this idea of good fires and bad fires, and the fact that, you know, the, the wonderful word, so ratinous, but, but that there are systems and, and seeds that are adapted to fires. So could you talk a little bit about fire-adapted ecosystems and why they're so important? And just be, because it's important, I think, as we start to demonize fire, to remember that it has a strong ecological function. Absolutely. So, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, but forests have burned for at least 150 million years. It's a fundamental ecosystem process to have fire and ecosystems. And there's a lot of tree species, wildlife, 
organisms that are adapted to fire from an evolutionary perspective. They need fire to, to thrive, right? One of the, the classic examples that's close to my heart is the lodgepole pine. Um, it grows prolifically in the forest of Yellowstone, which is just an hour and a half from, from where I grew up, and also happened to be the place where I got to do my PhD research while being based at University of Wisconsin, which was delightful to spend your summers in Yellowstone for five years. Um, so this tree species is so interesting. It, it has a thin bark, so it wants to be killed by fire, and it, it produces what we call serotonous cones. These are cones that hold the seas and they stay closed for many years with this really kind of nasty um, resin. Right. And they only open when they're heated by fire, which then means in this post-fire environment where there's a lot of light, a lot of nutrients, there's even a flush of water, these seeds are dropped into what at least historically was quite a wonderful environment to establish as a seedling. And the next generation would grow up and it would occur on a cycle of every you know, 100 to 300 years. Um, in 1988, Yellowstone burned in a series of massive fires. It was considered unprecedented at the time. There was newspaper articles about how this was the end of Yellowstone. It was ruined. Yellowstone is a moonscape. You can see a picture on the slide of what that looked like in, in 1988. And, and there was a tremendous amount of concern simply because we hadn't seen it, that the forest would not recover. And in fact, work that I did in my PhD and that my, my PhD advisor has built a career around and really championed and, um, and was on the frontiers of showed that in fact, 30 years post fire, those forests were able to recover prolifically, right? So now you drive through Yellowstone. This is a picture from 2013 from the same place. And you'll see trees everywhere and, and it doesn't look anything different from what was before the fire. So we have fire adapted uh, forests. We have species that are fire obligates, right? So how do the fires in 2023 fundamentally differ? And how do you define what's a good and a bad fire? Yeah. So we, we're starting to hear that language a lot about this is good fire, this is healthy fire, this is bad fire, this is catastrophic fire. And of course, there's a tremendous amount of nuance and a spectrum there. To, to unpack when we think about managing our forests. Um, the reason why fires today are becoming more severe, more catastrophic, more damaging than they were historically is, is one of the main reasons is climate change, right? So we've seen temperatures warm rapidly in, in forests like the Western United States, and, and that causes forests to dry out through this process we call vapor pressure deficit. So the idea is, is that the warmer the atmosphere is, the more water it can actually hold. And when it can hold more water, it actually sucks that, just like a straw, from the land surface. And so the water is being transferred from our fuels up into the atmosphere with warming. What this has caused is 20, like 2000 to 2021 to be the driest two decade period in much of the Western United right. States in 1200 years. So our forests are drier than they've ever been in millennia. And that causes, as we remember our fire triangle, big increases in burned area. And I'd love to talk about that a lot more. We have a lot to cover, but that issue of hotter, drier, more moisture, and then we get a huge rainfall like we did this year, and it's fascinating is how that's going to play out. And we maybe talk about that a little later. Um, so why is it that it's, um, you know, the Western fire and forest resilience, right? And, you know, what is it that makes for greater resilience in these forest, forests? And how do we start trying to think about how to manage fire so that we can have greater resilience, which I know is sort of part of this project and a broader set of projects that the Moore Foundation's funding? Yeah, absolutely. So, so forests were adapted to their historical fire regimes. We, that's another word we use is resilient to their fire regimes. And as those fire regimes are changing, as fire is becoming much, much larger, more severe, 
more frequent than they were during the Holocene, we're starting to see that resilience of forests erode. And, and what that means is sometimes forests are already not coming back after fires. They're being replaced by grasslands and shrublands, less carbon dense ecosystems. And we also have projections that suggest over the next few decades, a lot more of Western forests, if they were to burn, are likely to not recover. So on that same trip to Eastern Washington, we visited a site that burned a decade ago, um, right at lower tree line. So it's pretty hot, it's pretty dry there. And after a decade, trees have not reestablished. This is likely to persist in this kind of grassland, shrubland state that we're seeing for, for decades to come. Why that matters. I was going to say, does, what's, what's the impact of that, right? right? Because we love grazing ecosystems. We do a lot of work on them. And you know, why, why should we care? Yeah, forest resilience is such an important topic, especially in the Western United States. Because these forests in the West hold a tremendous amount of carbon mm -hmm. that, if released to the atmosphere, is likely to only exacerbate climate change. So right. positive feedbacks might emerge. They also provide really important wildlife habitat. But there's also really important relationships with even water and water insecurity in the Western United States. So, you know, we see headlines in, in the paper about Phoenix running out of water, limiting new developments. It turns out that the distribution of forests and, and forest dynamics play a really important role in the water cycle. And losing a bunch of forests is going to profoundly change the quantity and quality of water that's available to people over coming decades. And his, you know, geog geologically, we've seen some of these changes, but it's been th it will be thousands of years, even if we maybe hundreds of years, if we can reverse and capture carbon. But it's going to be a very long time before we start getting areas that have been gone, you know, converted from forest to savanna back into to forest. Absolutely. And we've got all these changes that are happening now, and you know, um, a lot of this, uh, you've got the buildup of of your your fuels is, as part of your triangle. Uh, I, of course, am you know, twice your age, or not quite, but close, um, half again. Uh, and I grew up with Smokey the Bear. Um, yeah. And you know, we all were preventing forest fires. And we were preventing forest fires for 100 years. So um, talk a little bit about the impact of, of that uh, very well-intended, but perhaps uh, ill-thought-out uh, management strategy. It ties back to the fire triangle, right? So we've been focused on the weather side, the climate side. The amount of fuels also makes a big difference if you remember that triangle. And, and before the like, early 20th century, um, a lot of fire happened in our ecosystems. Dry forests of the Southwest, mixed conifers of California, through a combination of lightning strikes, but also a tremendous amount of indigenous burning taking place. So indigenous communities have burned forests for time immemorial, and, um, and they did it for many reasons, including creating hunting habitat with good line site um, for hunting, for promoting wild foods that are super important, like berries, for um, oak acorns that would be ground up for foods. Um, and then, you know, in, right around the turn of the, the 20th century, with pre-Euro-American settlement, that indigenous burning ceased. And soon after that, uh, right around 1910, the big burn happened in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. These were just massive fires. They burned something like the area of, of Connecticut, killed 80 firefighters, um, burned a, a bunch of homes. And this was really a, a wake-up call or an eye-opening event for the newly formed Forest Service. So you got to, I mean, you got to think about it. I'm, I'm from the West Coast, so maybe this shows my bias a little bit. But it's a bunch of Yale foresters. Gifford Pinchot and Al, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. a bunch of Yale foresters coming out West, thinking they know how to manage forests. And then these massive fires happen. It takes everybody by surprise. And, um, and one of the things that happened from that was a very strong emphasis on suppression of fire, of conquering fire, of keeping mm -hmm. it from our, our all-important forests. And this culminated in the, the 1930s with the, um, the 10 a.m. policy. So the idea was that any fire that was sighted from a fire tower would be put out by 10 a.m. the next morning. And 
because of larger climate trends and workforce availability, and then eventually, um, you know, equipment becoming available after wars, so war, war surplus, um, we were highly effective at suppressing the fire through the 20th century. Now, the Forest Service has completely changed and embraced this idea of needing fire in our forests to maintain appropriate fuel loads. And so it's a fundamentally time, different time today, but we still are dealing with that legacy and some, not all of our forest types, but some of this universal suppression, which has led to this massive buildup of fuels. And particularly in drier environments where you don't get the decomposition and you don't get the natural loss of those, those fuels. And you and I were both at a, a meeting from the Conservation X Labs uh, Fire Grand Challenge. It was also funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And I think one of the interesting things about that, which you brought up, is this interdigitation between indigenous management of fires and the new fire regimes and how you take that knowledge and apply it. And you showed us some things from the Washington example, but I, I think that's clearly an area uh, rich for further exploration. Oh yeah, and, and a tremendous amount of momentum is building in that space, which is so inspiring and exciting. Yeah. So this meeting we were at included indigenous leaders from the Western United States, from the Amazon, and from, from Indonesia, right. coming together with Western scientists and, um, and um, trying to have dialogue about how we manage fire in this completely right. different time. Right. And, and, and in tropical forest fires are an, a relatively new phenomenon. So it, it was, you know, I think North-South exchange, East-West exchange, and, and intra-US exchange. So, um, all right, so uh, it's gone from good to bad and from bad to worse. Uh, where do you think it's likely to go next? Yeah, when we look to the future, it, it's, um, it can hard to be hard to be optimistic sometimes. Um, so, you know, we think of 2020 and 2021 as extraordinary years in the Western United States in terms of burned area. We think of 2023 as being extraordinary in, in Canada. But when you look at future projections based on climate of where fire is gonna go, so we're looking right now at a, at a time series of projections of burned area through 2100 for the Western United States, those extraordinary years become the average, right? So we have years that far exceed what we've seen in the record so far, and, and we still have some years with low fire because climate is variable even though climate change increases. But the, the best projections we have today suggest a doubling of burned area in the Western mm. United States um, compared to the, the last few decades. So just massive increases in burned area. And, and that will have tremendous impacts. Are there areas that are, you know, so if you think about coral reefs, some of the most interesting research now is coming out on refugia and coral reefs where you have upwelling zones or you have uh, Hot, heat adapted uh, commensal relationships uh, between the different organisms on a reef. Are there this similar kind of things where there are places where trees will survive, where we'll keep the seed source and, and, and have an optimistic view for the future? Absolutely. So there are absolutely going to be fire refugia, places that survive um, for whatever reason. Maybe they're in a, a wet landscape position. Maybe just randomly, fires don't ignite in those places, and, and they will persist through the next few decades for sure. Right. And provide really critical seed sources for thinking about replanting in places that, that have transitioned to grassland, for example. Yeah. So more beavers. Yeah. More beavers. Uh -huh. um, all right. Um, we have to think about fires differently, right? So we had a period of time up until about 1900 when you know, fires were, were, were useful and well-managed and, and a tool. Then we went into a stage where fires were, you know, evil and horrible and we suppressed them all. And now we've got climate change and drying out and more fuel and this massive fires. How do we change the way we think about fire so that we can manage it better? It really requires a, a fundamental shift in our mindset about living sustainably with fire, thinking about embracing fire in the ecosystems where it's ecologically appropriate to reintroduce fire, we should really prioritize doing that. And, and what's really exciting is that there, there is this very rapidly building momentum 
to reintroduce healthy fire to ecosystems, to do the mechanical thinning that then would allow prescribed burning to play its historical role. I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago even where we would be today, I would never have predicted the amount of momentum that's building. So just recently, in, you know, a little over a year ago or so, the U.S. Congress allocated roughly $10 billion to prescribed burning and mechanical thinning in, in U.S. forests. Um, states are really leading the charge. Um, so California is absolutely a thought leader in managing forests and fire. Washington and Oregon are, are doing really great work. And then what's been so exciting is philanthropic organizations are also really getting involved. So yeah. we've mentioned the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation who are sponsoring this event tonight. And they're launching just a, a quite an incredible initiative in terms of its boldness and vision to to really try to get ahead of the fire issue and to provide the resources to do it in an intentional way, mm -hmm. funding science to support it, thinking about synergies across different sectors in that, that campaign. Yeah. So, so you think there are new ways, and you've, you've got a picture there. Uh, it's another nice video of their, people doing some things. Can you talk a little bit about what they're doing? Yeah, so right here we're watching a prescribed burn take place in uh, a western forest. And so you can see folks are walking around with um, drip torches and lighting the forest floor, um, which consumes those surface fuels. But you'll notice that there's not a lot of ladder fuels that connect the surface to the canopy. Right. And so those prescribed <coughs> burns are staying low in that surface fuel and just consuming those to keep them from building up. And then there's some folks with chainsaws cleaning out right. things to make it so there aren't ladder Correct. fuels, so you can do that. Yep. Um, so we want to manage fire, but we want to use fire. Um, and I want to go into a little more detail. So the Western Fire and Forest Resilience Collaborative. Um, how do you see that moving forward? Uh, and what are its goals and objectives, and, and what's the structure of that collaborative? We're really excited about, about this opportunity. So we're um, developing a research program to, to try to co-create the science that needs to support environmental decision-making moving forward. And, and how we're doing that is we're engaging from the very beginning with decision-makers. So these are managers of forests at state and federal levels. These are folks that are adjacent to policy and, and policymakers themselves to really try to understand what their needs are as a community because those are the folks that have to make the hard decisions about how to steward our forests during a time of, of immense and profound environmental change. And then we're bringing the best science to bear that we can to support them in producing the, the knowledge that's necessary to, to steward those for us. Um, so we have a, a team of folks that are coming together over the next five to 10 years, kind of the, the rock stars of forest and fire ecology. Um, some of the names you've, you've seen throughout the talk already. And what we're really trying to do is address five different objectives. The first objective is to try to really understand the mechanisms that are gonna underpin how our forests change in response to increasing fire. So we know that it's really fine scale processes. Things like, is it wet enough for an individual seedling to establish that's gonna aggregate to shape broader scale outcomes. And so we need to understand those underpinning mechanisms. We also need to understand how our forests are changing in as real a time as possible. So we're using satellites and space to be able to track changes in forests and fire in very functional ways that a, a forest manager can relate to and understand rather than these indices that not even me as a scientist who thinks about them all the time can really understand. We're passing that information on to simulation models and advanced computing because forests and fire evolve over decades to centuries, right? It's not months to next year. And so we really need to understand how the decisions we make today and the conditions we see today are gonna turn into outcomes in the next few decades when our kids are out in those woods. We really wanna know what the consequences are for the ecosystem services, right? So how is our carbon gonna change? How is biodiversity gonna change? Where is forest cover gonna change? What about water? 
And then most importantly, as I alluded to, we want to do this all while building a community of practice with decision makers so that there is intimate exchange both ways. We can directly inject the science into decision making quickly because we know that that science is needed fast. But we can also be responsive to evolving decision maker needs because five years from now, we have no idea what needs decision makers are going to have right. given the change in this space. One of the challenges uh, that I have was when, when I was courting Winslow to come to Cary Institute, I promised him 40 supercomputing nodes because he told me he needed 40 supercomputing nodes. Of course, at the time, I had no idea how we would get that level of, of access. And to this day, it's still one of our greatest challenges. But I think there's something deeply ironic, this massive computing power that allows you to create these models that scale up from the individual tree all the way up to the entire region of the, the forest west. Um, somehow there's a, both a, a humor and an irony that uh, Gordon and Betty Moore, uh, <laughs> the, the man who gave us uh, Moore's Law, right, is, is funding this work because it is this power of massive computing that allows us to start making predictive models and then start playing with them so that you get, you know, one of the managers out in California says, could you add this variable in or, you know, this isn't working for us and so you can have that interaction back and forth. And, and as you said, it's a group of rock stars. Do we have the slide, Leslie, that, that has the pictures of people? Because I like seeing the, the pictures of people. I don't know if it made it or not. But it's a really remarkable group of men and women that are um, moving this forward. And, and how did you decide or how did you find this remarkable group of people, and, and when are you first going to all get together and talk about this more? So one of the beautiful things about starting a collaborative is you get to pick your team, right? Yeah. And so we looked for folks that we knew were some of the best scientists in the space, right? They are doing the groundbreaking work in their respective disciplines. But we also wanted to find people that were responsive, that were engaged and that were enthusiastic. Because if this is going to be successful, it's going to be about the synergies and the interactions. It's not going to be about the accomplishments of any one individual. Right. And so we've really tried to tailor it in a way that we're going to be able to collaborate, we're going to enjoy collaborating, and we're going to have insights because we're working together rather than side by side. Um, we're really excited, actually. Tomorrow, I'm heading over to Los Angeles for our kickoff town hall meeting. So we have 40 brilliant people coming to a room together. Um, Eric Holst at EDF, who's in the audience tonight, is going to join us. We're super excited about that. And um, we have 20 people who are in the decision-making space and about 20 people in the science space. And we're going to lock everybody into a, a nice room for a day and a half. And we're going to talk about and start to figure out where are those gaps that constrain decision making and how can we bring science to bear to fill those gaps. So I'm just super excited to, yeah. to kick that off. Well, and, and you know, the, the, we talk about social ecological processes and science itself is a social ecological process. And I love the fact that, that, you know, if you sent an email to somebody and they didn't answer, it was not a good sign, right? That's right. And when they answered, if it was like, well, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want, it was not a good sign. And you have a fil set of filters that help build uh, prospective collaborations that are more effective. And I think that is something um, that's a hallmark of the institution as well. We love to play in other people's play, in play, you know, uh, sandboxes. Um, and we like it when everybody plays nicely. So I'm really glad to hear that's working well. Um, we've got a few minutes more and then we can get some questions. And I'm curious, you know, mere mortals, right? You've got these policymakers, you've got uh, indigenous people with deep knowledge, you've got scientists trying to mesh this all together. Uh, what can mere mortals do uh, to try and affect change in these systems? Uh, you know, other than, of course, thanking Congress uh, for giving the Forest Service enough money that they're not spending half their budget on fire suppression. There's a lot that individuals can do in a, in a variety of, of different dimensions. So just a couple that, that I wanted to highlight tonight. Um, we talked about that shift in mindset to embracing fire where it's ecologically appropriate. And, and that's something that I, I think we all as individuals can, can really work on and think about. Fire is something that we're going to have in our landscapes. And it's something that's really critical to use 
to reduce the risk of these high severity catastrophic fires in the future. So being encouraging and supportive of ecologically responsible prescribed burning of mechanical thinning when the risk is too high to burn, super important. Of course, I'm biased here, but I think it's also really critical to advocate for the science so that we have science that underpins this decision making that, that we're gonna need to be doing over the next few decades. And then also, I think calling up your Congress people and saying, you know, thanks for investing in fire science, thanks for investing in proactive solutions, do more of it because it's gonna take more to solve this problem. Yeah. So being supportive of, of people for, for um, taking those steps is critically important. Yeah, and I would, I would say one of the odd things about early mid, the early part of the mid part of the 20th, 21st century is I never thought we would have to advocate for science. Um, I, I think it is uh, a little frightening, but also wonderful that we are uh, you know, taking, it, taking it back and, and really getting people to understand the importance of science underlying solutions. We don't, you know, science alone, I mean, so, solutions have policy, they have financial implications, they've got social implications, but I, I like to think that at least with science we can um, give people some options and then all those other things can come in. Um, and, you know, I think it's also uh, a, an indication of the scale of this problem, that the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation have given us generous seed funding but uh, we've got to go out and raise more money. Um, and so if anybody knows anybody who loves forests and, and wants to understand fire resilience, uh, do get in touch. Um, but Winslow, thank you so much. That was remarkable. I wanted to leave in like 10 or 15 minutes um, because we've got hundreds of people out there and somebody will feed questions from them. But let's give privilege to uh, people in the audience um, for questions and uh, we'll take as many as we can before we run out of time. Hi, uh, my name is Valkyrie. I've been in the wildfire space for about three years. I have a company that builds software for wildfire prevention. Uh, and my biggest question is, you know, when I was looking through the events for wildfire, you know, with the catastrophic events we've had this summer, this was one of maybe three that had wildfire in the title. And so I think it's important to bring, you know, like homeowner interest, just regular individual interest to the space. And one thing that I've struggled with um, in terms of just getting people into wildfire prevention is not just the education, but making it really simple, kind of implementing this false choice system where, you know, for something like recycling, it was really easy. Neighborhoods just started giving people recycling cans and they were like, oh yeah, it's easy for me to recycle now because I have a can. So is there something that you've kind of like seen in your work that is the equivalent to that, where we can give people kind of that false choice system uh, and make it easier for people to implement that into like their yard work or when they're buying a house, making that a priority? Great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, there is a tremendous amount of really interesting social science focused on understanding how communities can adapt to fire at the individual level up to the community level. And it's, a, it's an essential part of the, the equation. So home hardening is one of the terms that we're starting to hear a lot about. And it's, it's all about thinking how we build new homes and renovate existing homes in ways to make them much less prone to burning if a fire were to come through. And, and I think that's a, a really promising next step. Um, the other thing that, that I think we don't talk about enough, but, but has been a part of the conversation for a long time is thinking about creating defensible space around homes. It's, it's a very simple step, at least in theory, to remove the, the fuels around your home and create that buffer so that if a fire does come up. Now, of course, in extreme events, you can do this type of thing and, and your home might still be burnt, but, but in many instances, creating those buffers around your home of reduced fuels can really have a large impact. And, and um, that kind of action has been happening for a long time, but, but it's something that we could continue to expand on. And that would also have the interaction with aridity. Correct. So you get California Southeast, uh, sorry, the Southwest, where things are getting drier and drier, and so from an ecological perspective, there's a move to xeric gardening and, and having gardens that, that don't need a lot of water. Yeah, And so absolutely. you have a, a, win, a, a sort of a double win there by having less fuel and also using less water. So. Yeah. 
Other questions? Um, microphones going around so that the people out there, um, somebody's going to come around. I, I think we had two people in the front row raise their hands. So here, and then we'll move it over to there. Um, John Kramer from the Hudson River Foundation. Thanks for a really wonderful talk. I, I, my question is a bit of a follow-up, and it's an observation. And it might be that the pictures you put up of your collaborators is not exhaustive. But, but what I'm struck by is that um, have you thought of behavioral scientists, people who think about the salience of information at the wildlife urban interface, and to have those folks involved with some really tremendous work in that area as well? Great point. Um, so the list you see up there is not complete. We started with thinking through some of the core folks that we needed for the, the mission that we're facing. And we wanted to leave ourselves flexibility to start having these meetings with decision makers like we're doing next week at UCLA to understand where we're missing expertise. And that then allows us to, to figure out where those gaps are and then we can go out and fill those gaps. So I have a bunch of ideas, you know, like churning around there, but I want to make sure that we do it in a way that allows us to, to maybe find perspectives that we hadn't anticipated to bring into the group. So question in back, and then Mary Beth, there's another question up front. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. great. Um, so I don't know who invited the accountant, but I'm an accountant. And so I think about this, uh, I'm in the sustainability space um, from the business perspective. And so on the policy side, I'm hearing a lot of policy advocacy in the prevention, suppression. But I think about the business side. So the, the idea of a defensible space around your home. Um, has a potential policy implication on the insurance side. And so I'm wondering to what extent you guys have explored, I think about California, that's super cool, in this policy advocacy, policy redesign space, so maybe there's an opportunity there, and I'm wondering if you guys have thought about that as an avenue for change. Absolutely. Um, I think insurance is gonna play a, <laughs> a critical role in shaping the dimensions like we've seen with flood insurance, for example, and how that shapes home patterns. And there's indicators of that playing out already. I, I'm hesitant to go, as a forest ecologist, too far down um, providing opinions about insurance, uh, given that it's not my area of expertise. But it's, it's one of these threads that has been bubbling around the fire space for, for many, many years. and. Um, and I think it's only going to increase in, in terms of the, the amount that we're hearing about it and the impact that it has. Yeah. And, and early in the, Carrie's 40 years old, and early in our history we had a big grant from Swiss Re, uh, you know, reinsurance people, because they see the value of these long-term ecological studies to understand the threats to their insurance uh, uh, underwriting. So I, I think it's a great idea and you know I would love to see if we could um, partner with some of these groups because in the end they may well actuarially be the users of some of these models, right? That they should have value if we can understand uh, on a probabilistic way. We can't, you know, like, like insurance, we can't tell you which house is going to burn or which community is going to burn, but we can give you a probability and as people make changes, how that probability changes. I think it's a great suggestion to to try and form partnerships as we develop the models and get make them better. Um, next question. Um, I'll, be, I'll be there in just a sec. Okay. Can I grab one from the virtual? Oh, uh, yeah, why don't you, while yeah, we're running around, let's yeah, do something. Absolutely. Yeah, I was gonna, we're, uh, we're, can folks hear? Okay, super. Yeah. I just wonder, we have a virtual audience also tuning in, so I just wanted to grab a question from that audience. So someone asks, the Rim Fire burned hundreds of thousands of acres near Yosemite in 2013. Ten years later, the area is still scarred and doesn't seem to be recovering, not like the photos of Yellowstone. Are there special challenges there? Why isn't recovery obvious? So that ties in with the forest resilience um, topic that we talked about earlier, right? So as conditions are drying, as fires are getting larger, as fires are getting more frequent, what we're starting to see is forests not come back after fires. So a recent study that a, a colleague, it was an amazing, amazing study, um, that a colleague did um, showed that roughly 20% of the conifer forests, forests of the Sierra Nevada, if they were to burn today, 
would likely not regenerate as for us. So we're talking about quite a large amount of area. Now, maybe they won't burn or parts won't burn, right? But the, the template is set. And there's a couple reasons why that can happen. So one of them is that the fires have burned so frequently that the trees hadn't reached reproductive maturity when they burned, and so there was no seeds. Another reason the fire was so big that you can't get seed from the unburned edge into the middle. And then the third reason we see it a lot, um, and I did quite a bit of work of this on my PhD in Yellowstone, is that even if you have seed, if it's too dry, if it's drought, then the tree seedlings aren't going to establish anyways, and that can lead to this conversion to non-forest. So rim fire is an example, um, but there are many other examples across the West, and, and it's likely to continue to, to grow in, in, in how common it is. And then one more from the virtual sure. audience? Sure. Okay, thank you. So we had a few questions um, coming together on a common theme about how will, um, will we be using indigenous methods of fire management in the, the work that's happening? What, what will that look like, and how will that be incorporated, that knowledge? It's really um, an inspiring space to, to be in. Um, you know, cultural burning has been excluded for 100 years or more, 150 years, and we're starting to see it reemerge and be supported at, a, at, a, at quite a, a rapid rate. Um, and that traditional knowledge is so critical for how these forests were managed before pre-Euro-American settlement. So there's all of these examples of collaboration starting to inform, uh, form where um, indigenous communities are being empowered and they are co-developing fire management strategies with agencies to, to get more fire on the landscape in the places where it was historically and, and where, it is a, where it is ecologically appropriate. Um, the Moore Foundation and the initiative that they're doing has really put a lot of emphasis on this as well, and so there are a number of different examples of, of instances where that's coming up, and um, as we continue to develop our specific collaborative, we're really enthusiastic to think about how we can start to forge those relationships in, a, in an intentional and um, respectful way um, so it's not something that you rush in to, it's something that you do right, and we're really enthusiastic to be able to, to do that over the next several and, years. And the foundation's initiative is very much sort of three different pieces, one of which is understanding this, uh, the fire, which is the science that, that you're leading, and the second is the policy and, and advocacy and, and the space of how you manage, and then the third is the people on the ground managing. Absolutely. And I think the, the iteration that you're talking about, because this is a, you know, initially a five-year study, but I think it'll probably go for 10 or 15, and that iteration will probably happen after the first phase. Everybody gets their work done in the first phase, then they come together and say, okay, where are the gaps, and, and how do we do that? We have a couple more questions up here, uh, Mary Beth. There was one here, one here, and one there. Okay, I'm making my way. Okay, make your rounds. Uh, I can't see, you're in, you're in, in the sun, as it were. I, I can't see you, no, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so this goes a little bit off of the question related to indigenous practices. Um, I work in disaster relief. Uh, I live in Oakland, California, where a lot of the forests are filled with flammable invasive eucalyptus trees. And I just got back from a month on Maui, where a lot of the uh, burned land came from invasive grasses. flammable uh, grasses from the plantations. Um, so how do you manage a, a resilient wooey community when the forest itself isn't a, a balanced forest. Yeah, so invasive species are, are a really tricky piece to this, right? So we have a number of invasive species in the West United States, so cheatgrass is another example that, that really can be challenging for fire management. And, um, and so you have this collision of, of the wicked problem of invasive species with the wicked problem of, of fire. And, and I don't, you know, I think it's going to be a challenging one to tackle, especially when we consider how fast our forests, our native forests, are changing. And, and um, I think there is going to be a need for some pretty innovative solutions of how we deal with that at the scale at which it's unfolding. I, I don't have the solutions on me in my back pocket here. Otherwise, I, I might be somewhere else rather than yeah. 
sitting in front of you, but, um, <laughs> but it's a really thorny issue. So we've got a couple more questions up front, and I think we've got time for them. Um, one here, one here, <clears throat> and one there, and yeah. then we'll Hi, thank have you. to close up. I'm from uh, Center for International Forestry Research, um, which works mainly in the tropics. Um, you said um, prescribed, pre prescribed fire and selective removal of small trees is uh, one of the solutions to reduce wildfire. I was um, wondering if you have considered the impact on biodiversity, including the shrubs, you know, the, the soil microorganisms. Would you say something about that? Hmm? Thanks for that question. It's a softball. Uh, <laughs> well, to be clear, you know, these tools that we have in our toolkit, prescribed burning, mechanical thinning, they are not appropriate for all forests. So that's not a silver bullet solution. They are appropriate for specific forest types where this legacy of suppression has led to an accumulation of fuels that was not there historically. So it's gonna work potentially in some places, but it probably won't work in other places. And if done correctly, it's not done in a way where you're eliminating species from your species pool. It's reducing biomass of individuals um, in moderate and modest ways and fostering growth of larger individuals to become those big trees that we saw in that video. And what that can also do is facilitate the reintroduction of, of low severity fire to these ecosystem types that can actually foster biodiversity, foster microbial communities. There's, I don't know a ton about it, but I've been interacting um, and collaborating with some microbial ecologists, and there's actually a number of microbes that are also fire dependent, that disperse in smoke, for example. Um, so, so it can play quite a, an important role for fostering those things as well. So two more questions, gentlemen here, and then the gentleman there, or, or, or Dr. Um, Adney. <laughs> thank you so much, Winslow and, and uh, Josh, for this amazing conversation. Um, this is Marion Adney from Conservation X Labs, and I just, um, like probably many of you out there, uh, I have now burned in my brain the graph that you showed of the increase in burned area over the next 100 years or whatever it was. Um, and yet at the same time, we're, we keep hearing, um, you know, about how we need more good fire on the landscape. Uh, and we have um, policy and regulatory and agency systems that make it very difficult for agencies to sometimes let those fires burn. So uh, my question then is, in terms of the science side, how, how far along are we in using these kind of um, predictive models and also looking at past fires at making a, a decision about whether a fire or acres burned is a good fire or bad fire? And how can we apply that kind of science to the systems that we need to, to let decision makers make good decisions about letting the good fires burn? So in, in anticipation of the, um, the town hall meeting at UCLA, my colleague, Christina Bartowitz, who's online and moderating the online questions, um, did interviews with 20 managers at state and federal levels in the Western United States. And, one of the three knowledge gaps that emerged was that how do we differentiate between good and bad fire across broad geographies and at different scales? Um, and that's exactly the types of questions that we hope to and think that we can address with the team we're bringing together. Um, and then the, the separate question that's so important is, well, it, what do we do about it? And, and we know that we have these toolkits and there's some no-brainer places where we know we can get fire on the landscape and it would be a good thing, but from a logistics perspective, from a risk perspective, liability perspective, that's very, very hard. Um, and I don't have good solutions to that either per se, but as a modeler, one of the things I think a lot about doing is running counterfactual scenarios so, you know, we're basically recreating a representation of the system over and over again. 
And so we can ask ourselves, well, what happens if we do this? Or what happens if we do that? How does that compare to our baseline? And so we can run scenarios of, what if we try this really bold management strategy in this place and this one in this place, and see what the outcomes are in silica on the computer, where the risk is non-existent because we're burning CPUs, we're not burning for us. And, um, and then at least use that as some kind of information and evidence for how these might play out in the future and their rel relative efficacy. Mm -hmm. So we think that that is one potential strategy to help support decision makers in, in making the case for, for this being really important. Can, do we have time for one more question or are you gonna, it's eight o'clock and I'm wondering, would, is it okay if we do one more question? Yeah, okay. Uh, Lori, and then we'll do one here. Mary Beth, it's, can you, this gentleman's waited very patiently, so can you bring the mic up to him and then we'll do that? Or do we only have one working mic? <laughs> Go ahead, Lori. So, so this is um, another on the ground question. The goal of this collaborative research is to connect science and pol to policy and management. But what are some of the challenges and opportunities associated with the patchwork of policies at different levels, management agencies on different lands, and forests with different burn regimes. So how does it all come together? What a challenging question, right? And that's something that we're just, as a group, starting to scratch the surface on and start to learn the landscape and to learn the, the, the keystone people. I think if we're going to be successful, that's gonna be the approach that's gonna work, is to identify who are the the bridgers, who are the people that span those very complex um, dimensions to policy, to land management, who are the people that everybody talks to because they're known to be the person that can make things happen. And of course that's not easy to do, but that's the process we're starting is to figure out to, how do we identify those folks. Okay, and one more question up here and then we'll be done. If we've got a mic, do we have a mic? Thank you for being patient. Right here. Thanks very much. Hi, Winslow, thank you. I appreciate the work you're doing. Given the trajectory that we're seeing in forest fires, given the drought we're facing, I understand the logic of what your folks are trying to do, and it makes all the sense in the world, but one box that doesn't seem to be there is suppression in terms of complementing your efforts given what we're looking at and given drought at the same time? That's a great question and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about that. So um, suppression is actually a, a really valuable resource and, and strategy in particular contexts, right? So we've talked a lot about prescribed burning, we've talked about mechanical thinning, but as I just mentioned in answering a previous question, that's not always the appropriate strategy. And, um, and the strategies really have to be tailored to the local fire regime, to the local forest dynamics. So in our Yellowstone example, for example, those are forests that for the last 10,000 years have, have always burned every you know, 100 to 300 years in big stand replacing crown fires. Surface fire that was very frequent because of you know, low fuel densities was not normal there. And so those are contexts where going in and doing prescribed burning or mechanical thinning would likely not have meaningful outcomes. And so we might have really a lot of flexibility to use suppression strategically when you know, conditions allow for us to do suppression to protect values at risk. Another example of, of where there's actually quite a lot, a lot of momentum building for using suppression is in boreal forests of Alaska that similarly have had these really big stand replacing fires every hundred years. Um, and there, we are, there, we're already starting to see management experiments with using suppression to protect carbon um, and to treat it as a value at risk. And a, there was a, just recently a Washington Post article that came out a, a week ago that summarizes that. It, wonderfully written, I suggest you read it if, if you're interested in that topic. So it's gonna be really exciting to see 
how that unfolds. It's kind of a management experiment at, at a scale that I've never seen before, and I am fascinated to, to see how it unfolds. I'm actually currently writing a proposal, like right today, <laughs> I was working on it on the car ride down to be able to study that and to be able to understand what outcomes might be in coming decades using our modeling approaches. Thank you very much. Great question. Um, Winslow, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming to one of the three official Climate Week uh, events that actually talks about fire. Uh, thank you for that fact. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can find us at carryinstitute.org. Uh, or um, come up to Millbrook and visit. So thank you very much and have a great evening.